They heard God tell them they had love in their hearts for children who truly needed it. Andy and Leah Lynch share their story of adoption. 28 years old and single, but keeping his eyes on what God has planned. Meet Brian Williams, author of Safe Thus Far, My Testimony. And Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Collection Week has just come to an end. Find out how one local church came together to show their support for children in need. Welcome to a brand new television special here on TV44. Acts 44 presents. Why Acts 44? What you may not realize is TV44's actual name is American Christian Television Services. The acronym is ACTS. But even more significant is the connection between TV44 and the Bible verse, Acts 4, verse 4. Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men grew in their faith. That is the mission of TV44, to share the life-changing word of the gospel and to grow the kingdom of Christ. Acts 44 Presents is a TV program that shows God in action. Local people using their God-given talents and skills to bring more people to a saving relationship with Jesus. We start with the story of Andy and Leah Lynch. In the United States every year, over 135,000 children find a home through the process of adoption. That may seem like a staggering number. However, for each family, it's a miracle for, our, for them all. For our own Andy Lynch and his wife Leah, it's personal. I recently sat down with the Lynches. They share their story with me full of prayers, promises, and some heartbreak of how God provided them two amazing miracles. A couple years in is when we started trying, and after a year, um, that was when this whole process started um, for, for the adoption. So that Sunday morning, uh, the message was about if there's a need that you can fill, then you're, you're supposed to fill it. You know, God puts needs around us that we have the ability to fill, right. and that kind of hit home to us. Yep. I know for me, it was coming off of a season where it was, you know, it was challenging and um, it had challenged my faith as we had spent so much time um, going through the infertility and that sort of stuff and um, really felt like God was, was speaking to my heart that morning. And my response to him was, well, if you're speaking to me, you better be speaking to him then too. <laughs> we closed the bedroom door for a moment and he looks at me and goes, well, what did God say to you this morning at church? And I looked back at him and I said, well, what did he say to you? <laughs> and that was, you know, we knew that at that point God was saying, you have love to give. And um, this is how I want you to, to build your family. And so medically, sure, there were things we still could have tried, but we knew that God was saying, this is, this is the path I have for you. And that um, got the ball rolling. God was saying, here's what I really want you to do, and I need you to be on board for this. Well, that was September, and um, we didn't sign our first paperwork until December of that year. And so we spent the end of that year um, researching agencies and figuring out what we were going to do because this was all new to us and so trying to figure out you know who are we going to use for a home study who are we going to use for placement you know are we going to go domestic are we going to go international and there is you know there's so many questions and so many components that go into that um, that we had to spend a lot of time just praying through it talking through it and figuring out you know what we wanted to do and so and then March is when we were first matched with a birth mother down in Texas who had three or four other kids. Mm -hmm. My brother lives in Texas, so we thought this is what God wants. We're, we're going to go down there and we'll live with him until all the paperwork's done. Baby was due in June of 2009. Um, so we were excited. We had a name picked out. We had the crib, you know, right. already. The room was ready. End of February to the beginning of May um, is that portion of our journey before things um, started to get tough and we hit our first um, pretty significant valley in, in the journey. So we were up in Chicago celebrating his birthday. It was the third inning and I got a phone call from our 
from our social worker. And um, so I stepped out from where we were at and into the concourse so I could hear what she, you know, was going to talk to me about. And um, she had called to let us know that the birth mom had decided to parent. You know, here we were, we were two weeks away from flying to Texas for the birth of the baby. And we get a call that um, we no longer have a child um, that we're going to have. And it felt like we had lost mm -hmm. our first child. As far as we were concerned, our baby was, was gone and, you know, what was next, we didn't know. Andy asked me if I was angry with God, and I said, no, I'm, I'm not angry, I'm just sad. I'm just, I'm disappointed, um, because it was, it was very much a loss. You will hear that losing an adoption can be equated to, you know, to a miscarriage, and it's very much, um, very much that, because we were expectant parents. We were two weeks away from having a child, and suddenly we didn't have that. According to research, around 20% of adoptions end up not being fulfilled due to many reasons, including the birth mother changing her mind. Andy and Leah now were facing the obstacle many couples seeking to start a family face. Should we go on, try again, or just stop? For believers, it is one of the most faith-filled decisions you can make as a couple. The investment not only of emotions and time, but also finances can be overwhelming and can go on for years. But for Andy and Leah, they felt they knew God had called them on this journey. And despite a setback, they were willing to take a step in faith again. And what would happen next would change their thoughts on how their adoption would work. And it would all begin with a call from an old friend. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, hey, I've got a friend that I grew up with in high school and her younger sister or his younger sister is pregnant. Um, and they want a Christian family um, to, to raise this little boy. And our first placement was gonna be, our first child was gonna be a boy too. Um, and so we knew, we just knew that this is what, what God wanted. Leah was doing the scores, the ticker and everything for Sports Report, and she runs into my office 10 minutes before the show where I'm trying to get everything together and people are saying, oh, I just got this, and it's madness. Yes. Anyone who's been there, it's madness. And she runs in and shows me her flip phone. I stick it right there in front of his face, in front of him, between him and the computer. And it says, will you adopt my baby boy? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> all these emotions came rushing back right. because of all we'd gone through. Did we ever think we'd get to this point again? Right. And the baby was due in December. So this is three months away. And so I put all that away and I go do sports report. And then it was 90 minutes. Right. And getting ready to come back to us, me for the last block, and Mark Shine says, and we understand Andy's going to be a dad. Congratulations, Andy. Back to you. <laughs> okay, Mark. <laughs> Let's take a break. We got to we got to get to know his birth mom and um, about a month after that we got to actually meet her for the first time face to face and we went out to dinner with her and her mom and um, it was at that moment that um, when we walked out of that restaurant that we knew God was up to something um, because all along leading up to this point we had been very convinced that we were going to have a closed adoption and that we didn't want to have any connection whatsoever with birth families um, because we were just we were scared we were scared of what would happen and we walked out of that restaurant knowing that adoption was much more than just a way to build a family that it was much more than just a way to love on a child, that there were so many other people involved in this story. Um, the, the birth parents, the, the, the birth grandparents, the extended family. I mean, there were so many more um, components and people that were involved in this than we ever considered. And, you know, we sat in the car before we pulled away and we made the decision that this was going to be um, an open adoption. And um, we, we wanted that. We wanted to be able to stay connected. And so, um, and so we have. It has been, um, it's had its ups and its downs. Um, we would, our, our option, open adoption would probably 
Um, in technical terms, would probably be considered kind of like a semi-open adoption because there's not a ton of um, face-to-face interaction. But we, you know, I text with her a few times a year and um, we get together with her and we meet um, we meet with her twice a year usually on summer break and Christmas break it's been a challenge because there have been on our end with our kids there have been questions um, and we've had to navigate those waters and we've had to um, we've had to answer tough questions um, but something that we have been telling our kids from um, from the beginning before they even knew what we were telling them was that um, that God picked them special just for us. I wouldn't change it. Hmm. I wouldn't change it. it. It's been hard at times, but I wouldn't change a thing. Nearly two years following God revealing to Andy and Leah they should adopt, they brought home their son Nathan. Like most parents, they felt Nathan should have a sibling. So Andy and Leah decided they would enter the adoption process again. They share with me not only how things went differently this time, but the unique perspective that adoptive parents who are believers have about their relationship with our Heavenly Father. We put our names back in. Nathan was um, turned one in December of 10, and we put our names back in the first weekend of April of 11. And in our minds, Nathan's process took a year and five days from start to finish. Like, okay, great, this will be good by the time he's a year, year and a half, two, somewhere along, or by the time he's two, two and a half, um, we'll have another one. Perfect. Um, so um, we put our names back in the first week of April, and God decided quite differently. Um, and nine days after we put our name back in, our agency calls and says, we have a birth mom who's picked you, and she's having a little girl. And from that phone call, Nine days later, Anna was born. <laughs> Nine days. We had a 16-month-old in the house who was a boy, and we had nine days to prepare for a newborn little girl to join our family. Mm -hmm. Her birth parents had been calling the agency multiple times, um, but never willing to leave contact information. And so the agency never had a way of staying in contact with her birth parents. Um, and it wasn't until our profile was on the website that they called the agency and said, we've picked a family. Here's where we want our little girl to go. And we're like, we needed an extra crib because Nathan was not out of a crib yet. Um, we needed girl clothes. We and needed it was, a name. We didn't we, know. Yeah, I mean, we, it was, we needed everything. We weren't <laughs> anticipating it coming that quickly. Had we not taken that step of faith and said, okay, we don't know what's going to happen, um, but we're going to do it. Had we not done that, then we wouldn't have had our little girl. And, you know, it, it's just how God worked in both stories ha is, it's incredible. You know, they weren't physically born of us, but um, it has been really cool to see that whole, you know, nature versus nurture type of thing. And yes, there are things about the kids and about their physical traits that can't even remotely be attributed to us in no way, shape or form. And they'll always have that. There will always be those differences. Um, but it has been crazy to see um, how um, Anna is your little mini me and Nathan is mine. Um, and just, you know, their personalities and how, um, you know, how God is just, I mean, there's no question that God put us together the way he did for a purpose and for a reason and that these kids are our kids. It, this is a loving choice mm -hmm. that they, they wanted you to come into this world. They knew they weren't ready to have kids. And so they wanted to give you a family. And, and so they understand that, that it wasn't, that they weren't wanted, it's that they're, they're loved very much by their birth parents. It's hard to put into words um, the, the insight that you have as an adoptive parent to the way that God loves us. Um, because we, as God's children, are adopted into His family. And so, you know, we see it as a, you know, as a blessing, as a unique, slight, um, you know, look into how you know, how God loves us. And so to be able to convey that then to our kids of how much 
God loves them um, because they have, it's part of their story that they have, um, you know, evidence in their life of being loved with a truly unconditional love. When Nathan was about two and a half months old, we got paperwork in the mail from our attorney. And I mean, we're talking like big stacks of paperwork and it was all the medical records um, from his birth mom from the pregnancy and from her medical records and that sort of stuff. And I was sitting on the couch flipping through them and I get to this page and I stop and I said, Andy, you've got to come look at this. He looks at me and goes, no, just tell me what it is. <laughs> I was like, no, you've got to come see this. And so he came and sat down on the couch beside me and we were looking and staring at this paper in disbelief because what it was, was that it was the record of her um, first ultrasound when she was um, seeing Nathan for the first time, when she was um, experiencing him in that way for the first time. And when we looked at the date and the time stamp, it was the day and the time that we were at Wrigley Field, um, that we had gotten the call that we had lost that first adoption. And just to be able to see how God worked behind the scenes, that God was already working in the middle of our grief. Because of that, and because of that's how he pulled things together, it was, it was a beautiful journey. Nathan and Anna are now seven and six years old, respectively. Nathan is almost eight. And just like parents who had children naturally, they share a common perspective with adoptive parents. The efforts and tribulations of raising a child are overshadowed by every moment of joy that child brings. If you'd like more information on adoption, contact us right here at TV44. Our next story refers to adoption of a different kind. It may not be permanent, but when a person packs an Operation Christmas Child's shoebox, they are making a connection with a child in need. And that takes us to Union Chapel Missionary Church. Perhaps you packed a shoebox this year, knowing it will be sent to a deserving child somewhere around the world. Union Chapel Missionary Church decided to challenge themselves this year. 1,000 shoe boxes, and they spent the entire year working together in unity to make it all happen. What does the number 12,800 mean to you? How about adding a personal connection to that number? 12,800 people, lives, potentially about to be changed, each due to a simple shoebox gift. November all across the country means Operation Christmas Child shoebox collection time. And in Allen County, the 2017 goal is 12,800 boxes. Hundreds of churches, families, and individuals are taking part. And there's one area church that's been working on their shoebox project all year, Union Chapel. Because we end up with 12 months divided by the number of gifts. Like we have a wow gift, which is often a stuffed toy. And then there's t-shirts and school supplies and soap you name it. Now we're not allowed to send candy for obvious reasons. It melts. Hard People could choke on, on hard candy. But then people bring in specific things every month and then we kind of hole it away and then we have one month where people give money to help with the shipping. That 12 months of planning culminated into one night of high energy packing. The entire gymnasium filled with everything from the wow toys to hygiene items. And not just that, but dozens of people participating in the act of giving back, giving out, helping someone who has a need by packing simple items into shoe boxes. We're packing, um, Christmas boxes for people I don't get Christmas much. I put rags, notebooks, a pencil, soap, toothbrush. Um, stuffed animals, paper, pencils, rulers, glue. I am coloring a picture for kids that don't get presents and that are just very poor. And I'm hoping they'll write me back. Toys, soap, school supplies, personal letters, and one more very important item packed inside each one, prayer. Uh, prayer is so important. Um, getting the right shoebox to the right child, only God can do that. We can pack the shoeboxes, but he has to do the rest. And so um, we want to pray for the individuals that receive the boxes, that they know, get to know Christ, and they go through the discipleship program. Um, it's really important to us. So important that the physical packing stopped several times throughout the night so that important component of prayer wouldn't be forgotten. And Lord, as we always pray, somehow in your divine 
unequaled way, take each box and place them into the hands and hearts of the child that needs that box. Lord, we can't do that. All we can do is pack and send, but you can do it. So, Father, we just dedicate and commit all these things to your care and bless the remainder of our evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Union Chapel decided to take on a personal goal of 1,000 boxes, 1,000 children who will be given special gifts, including the opportunity to accept the gift of eternal life. That's a look at God in Action. I'm Jennifer Beck for TV44. Have you ever found yourself asking God, why am I here? What is my purpose? Or maybe you've looked at situations in your past and thought, why did that happen? Or how can I get past that? Well, today we welcome author Brian Williams, who has written an incredible testimony called Safe Thus Far, where he dives into all kinds of typical situations that every single one of us have to face. But we have to decide if we're going to face them with God or on our own. And you have chosen to face them with God. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let's go ahead and talk about Safe Thus Far. Describe to me the essence of your book. As it's in my book was, I have faced a lot of situations that most people have faced in their 20s, um, teenage years. I have chosen to look to God instead of looking to my own plan. It's been very hard um, dealing with insecurities, doubt, um, things that people feel like I should be on a certain path that I'm not, um, but I've always chose to look to God because I know at the end of the day, He always has my best interest at heart. So. The back of your book has a very simple but direct message for any Christian that is struggling with friends, prayer, doubt, abstinence, insecurities, or just trying to find your purpose in life. This detailed journey of a single man's story is proof that God can handle it all if we just ask. There's several things I really like about this book. It's very simple to read. It's direct and whether you are single like Brian's situation or you're not, I think there are applicable uh, truths in this book for you, and they are broken down chapter by chapter. Um, your first one, I'm a redhead. You know, I think anybody could resonate with something like that because we've probably all gone through things in life. God made us a certain way, yeah. and man will tell us it's not right. Yep. But yet, even in these simple things, you're right away saying, right from the start, you got to stick with God in everything. Well, being a little kid, my hair was very bright red, um, and it was, it's gotten darker over the years, <laughs> but um, kids are very mean. Um, in school and I never realized anything was wrong with me until I went to school um, and people pointed things out because not very many people have red hair and there's also other insecurities that I've dealt with um, just growing up and looking at other people and realizing that I'm different um, but I stopped and looked in the mirror one day and I thought how can I just just criticize God's work and what he's done in my life and like I'm not good enough um, it's not fair to me, and it's not fair to God to think that something that he created isn't, isn't beautiful just the way it is. So that's just chapter one. Chapter one, I'm a redhead. What, a, what an easy way to get into this book as you dive into more topics. Um, one of the things that you talk about in here that I think can really um, hit with a lot of people is the topic of church hurt. You went through church hurt, but you didn't allow that to keep you out of the church. That can be a tough hurdle to go over to walk back into the church. We look at God's people and we put them on a pedestal higher than anybody else because we have such high expectations um, as Christians. And um, my parents were hurt in the church when I was very little and we stopped going um, for a very long time. And my grandparents actually started taking me to church. And then once I actually got into church myself as a teenager and young adult, I experienced some church hurt myself um, and I've had to look at people and just realize that we're all imperfect. Um, none of us are God. We all have our daily struggles and imperfections that we have to deal with, and, but we have to look past that and just learn to forgive each other mm -hmm. um, and just continue serving God like he wants us to do. Safe Thus Far, My Testimony by Brian Williams is the book that we're discussing, and we have author Brian Williams with us. This is a book that uh, is a testimony of Brian's life, but the topics that are in it are applicable to every single person. I'm going to read to you from a chapter called, I Stayed Away. I didn't want anyone getting close to me. I assumed that once they did, they would end up leaving and I couldn't deal with that pain again. I went to church and left as soon as it was over. I didn't want to hang out with anyone outside of church or even talk to them on the phone. I was done. 
I didn't want anyone else to hurt me because I didn't want those feelings to consume me and result in me pushing God to the side again. I didn't want to deal with the pain and disappointment again. I couldn't do it. You're speaking your testimony, but I am sure you are speaking the mindset of so many people. We do get into that um, trust situation where people have hurt us, yet you're telling us right here that it is worth it to push through that, to not just forgive, but to be willing to trust again. And is that a place where you found yourself in your life? Yes, um, and presently as well. Um, there's always something and going on in everyone's life, and we don't know. I don't know what's going on in your life, and we don't know what's going on in the lives of the strangers that we pass at the grocery store. Mm. Um, hurt is something that can consume us, and it can take away our focus from God. But the thing I've learned is God has given me so much, and he still has so much more in store mm -hmm. for me that I can't turn my back on him despite what others may do to me or to those around me that I have to keep pushing on. And I know, because I've seen and I've been through enough to know that God always has a plan. And even though the hurt may hurt really bad at the time, that he will take us to a place much higher um, after, the, after the hurt is over, so. Great points. Good things. Thanks a lot, Brian. Brian Williams, the author of Safe Thus Far, My Testimony. This book is available at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksAmillion.com. You can also purchase it at Reed Morris Hallmark on Flanders Avenue, Harding Highway, and Elm Street here in Lima, as well as the UNOH Barnes and Noble Bookstore. Brian Williams, author of Safe Thus Far, My Testimony. Thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. The TV44 annual campaign is underway now. Your donation of any amount is used in full to spread the message of Jesus Christ to all in the region. TV44 is a family-friendly station. The programs are safe for all ages, and TV44 stands on the Word of God and biblical truth. Donate today by phone, mail, or online. You can also sign up for automatic monthly withdrawal. Thanks for your prayers and your partnership, as together we carry Christ's mission into 2018. That's a reminder that our annual funding campaign is currently underway. We are so thankful to the many of you who faithfully support this ministry on an ongoing basis. Our annual funding campaign is the boost to move us into the next year. This year's goal is $220,000, and at the time of taping this show, we had reached about 35% of that goal. Now, if you've been thinking about financially partnering with TV44, now is the perfect time. No gift is too small, and they're all tax deductible. There are five safe and secure ways to donate. Call us at 419-339-4444. Visit us in person or mail to 1844 Beatty Road, Lima, Ohio 45807. Donate online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at wtlw.com forward slash donate. Or do what I do, sign up for monthly automatic withdrawal. This allows you to support TV44 every single month at an amount that fits your budget. Call us at 419-339-4444 or email contact at WTLW.com and we will send you a withdrawal form. Finally, just as we desire to pray for you, we ask that you also pray for us. Operating a nonprofit TV station is not an inexpensive venture. God has sustained us for 35 years and we trust Him to keep us going as long as He desires. Well, thanks for joining us for our first Acts 44 Presents special. Special thanks to John Ondo, Jeremiah Wright, Wayne Getz, Pam Martin, Colin Pate, and Nick Fraley for your involvement in the production of this TV special. From all of us at TV44, we want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. We truly are thankful for you.